guess we'll go ahead and get started here. How many of you have even seen Meridian 59? Hey, more than, more than half. Uh, in that case, this will be a reminder for you. We're going to start off with a movie here. I cannot take credit for this movie. This is a fan movie that was put together very recently, so it is the latest version of Meridian 59. Can we lower some lights a little bit? And that's Murder in 59, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, whatever fan out there somewhere put this together so that I could steal it from my presentation. A little round, come on, let's go. I'm here to give you a history of basically how this happened and what we did and sort of what I see as the significance of Meridian 59. Uh, it's a uh, long presentation, uh, 80 slides. I'm going to talk fast. I apologize in advance. Uh, but there's a lot of crazy to go through here. Um, first off, the big question is, what is Meridian 59? Why is it significant? Uh, almost anything that people say it was the first of, there's an example of something else that actually did it first. Uh, we weren't the first 3D game. That was really Air Warrior. Uh, we weren't the first uh, MMO by a major company. That was really uh, Habitat's bag. We were kind of the first thing that put all those pieces together, though. A good way to say it is that it's best to think of us as the missing link between those early days and what became EverQuest and World of Warcraft. And we were very, very much into sort of that vein of, of gameplay. Uh, we did have a 3D engine. It was a sprite-based BSP uh, in, in, in engine, similar to the Doom uh, games. And we were one of the earliest in the unmetered era. Uh, right before we launched, we were not planning to be an unmetered game, but right before we launched, AOL changed their entire business strategy so that they were unmetered. Um, before that happened, Meridian 59, well, because of that, we were the ones that pioneered basically the $60 box plus 10 bucks a month. Uh, so you can thank us for subscription charges, everybody. Um, before that, online gaming was played at an hourly uh, fee. You would actually pay by the hour, in some cases by the minute, for your online gaming. And that was on top of what you're paying AOL. Back then, playing online games is what rich people did, right? There were people who talked about having $10,000 uh, game playing bills. And just crazy. Uh, if you look at where we were in sort of the spectrum uh, of gaming, really you have to look at the ancestor, the first age was really Mud One. This is the Richard Bartle game. Uh, and then you go into the, what I call the Portal Age. And those are islands of uh, Kesmai, Habitat, Gemstone, uh, Dragon's Gate, the Imagination Network. All of these were behind those firewalls that you had to pay to get through. 
Uh, Meridian 59 was part of that next generation, a very, very short generation, uh, which was basically unmetered, but also before we went massive. We were talking about hundreds of players online at a time, uh, and it wasn't until the next year, uh, Ultima Online came out, that we really went into the massive age. And then you move forward from there, you have the post-WoW age and the free-to-play age, which is what I believe is starting now as being told to us by about a gazillion talks uh, at this conference. The other thing that was going on around that time before we launched is that there was a lot of free tech happening, and this was mostly in college campuses. Back in this time, pretty much the way that you connected to the Internet, if you were not on AOL or Genie or one of those networks, is that you went to college, and you had a college account. And you would, uh, if you wanted to play a MUD, you would use Telnet and play an all-text game uh, by that way. And there were several code bases that sort of kicked in. Uh, they go back earlier than this, but they really started to pick up in the late 80s. Uh, that people would use to play the internet. This is mostly relevant because this is where the expertise came for my generation of games, effectively. So uh, my team, the Underlight team, uh, the Ultima Online team, the EverQuest team were all very, very heavily influenced by this generation of gaming. The other thing that I feel it's important to uh, say for the sake of uh, posterity is that the uh, Korean tangent happened around the same time that we did. I mean... It's almost amusing in retrospect how we thought that EverQuest was a big deal when Lineage had huge numbers across the ocean that went ignored for a very, very long time. Uh, last but not least, just for completion, uh, the kids' tangent is the other thing that happened across, started across the ocean that no one paid attention to for a very long time but is now sort of the forefront of the free-to-play age that's starting now. So anyway... This is a post-mortem, so it's good to talk about what went right and what went wrong. And that's very simple for Meridian 59. What went right is that we happened to be in the right place at the right time. We were very, very lucky. What went wrong was pretty much we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have any money to do it any better. And so pretty much everything you can possibly imagine went wrong. So now let's go back to some history here. It really starts with these two brothers. Um, I apologize for the pictures. These are not from that era of time, and Andrews is particularly blurry. Uh, they did not get me pictures like I asked them. They were both interns at uh, Microsoft. Uh, one was 19, one was 21, when they had this idea of, hey, let's code a door game. Do, who remembers door games? Back in the day, connecting, to the, uh, connecting online wasn't even connecting to the Internet. It was very frequently connecting to a BBS that could hold maybe sometimes as many as 16 people at a time, and maybe you'd play... Uh, with those players at the same time. More frequently, it was an asynchronous kind of game that you played. But they figured they could make a pretty good door game, pretty good 16-person game. And this is 1992, 1993. And so they started to throw together some code in order to make that happen. This is the very first Meridian 59 screenshot. As you can tell, it's a little more low-tech uh, than what you saw in the movie. And it had programmer art. And they would go ahead and sort of move that forward. Uh, this is it, the same game with slightly better art. You can see sort of the, the tiles. Chris Kermsey actually drew these himself. As you can tell, he was not an artist either. Uh, at some point, Andrew bought a book. Uh, I forget the title of it, but it was something along the lines of uh, writing Doom Engines for Dummies. And he said, hey, I could totally do this. And he actually started to put together a very basic BSP engine. This is one of the earliest uh, screenshots of the 3D engine in action. You notice it doesn't even have a skybox yet. Um, I think this is actually uh, a zone that I designed. You can tell because it's terrible. They didn't have any art, and so they, their first art was actually just stolen from Doom wholesale just to, in order to test out the technology and see if it would work. Simultaneously, in California, two brothers were getting bored with their job writing software for a medical company, and they decided that maybe they could write a, a, an RPG, an online RPG. Uh, Mike had this wacky idea of combining a text mud with actually putting art on a CD. This was before Myst. A lot of people had this idea simultaneously. Oh, my God, crazy. We could put art on a CD. Maybe someday there will be enough CD-ROMs out there that this will work. Yeah. So they... Uh, contracted out some Swedes, 
uh, who basically took their money and didn't do any work. Uh, and they pretty much had to accept the idea that these guys flaked on them. And so they put out an ad on, a, uh, on the Usenet saying, hey, we're looking for guys who can actually you know, show up and code this technology for us, to which the currency said, oh, we already have that technology. And uh, the sellers flew out, and the currency showed them what they have. It was pretty impressive. It could hold 30 people at a time. Uh, it was very rudimentary 3D. It was a big deal. And so they decided to actually make a go of it, and they signed a deal, and that was when Archety Archetype Interactive was formed. At this time, it was pretty clear that the uh, Internet was actually going to happen, and they said, okay, we're going to abandon this idea that Meridian 59 would be a door game, and it would actually become something that would play onto the, on the Internet. Uh, the currencies would handle all of the programming. Uh, they actually were getting a lot of their friends to help code uh, the engine, getting, um, you know, just getting whatever contributors they could code-wise. Uh, the sellers would pretty much handle everything else, uh, design art, but most importantly, actually getting money. Uh, Mike Sellers was supposed to design the game. He did, found he didn't have the time, and so he saw this nobody posting on a Usenet, and he said, you, guys, you seem to have some good ideas. Do you want to come over and join the Meridian 59 team? And this guy named Raf Koster said, no, no, I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. I just got this job with these guys. You should talk to my friend Damien. That's how I got into the games industry. I happen to know Raf Koster. Uh, once the forged archetype, and one of the earliest phone conversations that I had, there were actually really long discussions about what the name should be. It was, you know, I was the junior guy on the team, and so it was mostly me listening to them argue back and forth about this. Originally, the name of the game, they just knew that it wasn't going to be Blackstone anymore, so they, they tried Terra Nova. Then they found out that that was trademarked. So they said, oh, how about Meridian? Let's do Meridian said. No one's going to trademark that. That was also trademarked. Uh, so then they slapped a number on the end of that because that was the easiest way for them to come up with a trademark that would be easy to legally defend. And that's the name that stuck. It was not obvious at the time that we would have no idea what to name the sequel in the future, Meridian 60. And the other thing that's worth noting is that we had no idea what that name meant at the time. And it wasn't until like a year after we shipped that we had some writers somewhere retcon any idea of what Meridian 59 actually meant. It was just totally a trademarkable name. Uh, the key things that were also key to us being in the right place in the right time, which is basically having uh, a vaguely networkable game in 1996, the first is that uh, Windows 95 made it possible to actually write a reasonable client. It, that made it possible for this very green programming team to actually write a client that a lot of, uh, 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 that a lot of clients could run. And then the second thing is that uh, basically the rise of the slip slash PPP internet connection, which basically meant that people all over the place were starting to connect directly to the internet. Oh my God, Netscape, remember that? Those were the days. That, that's the area that we were living in. This was a big deal for us. It made it all possible. Um, the level editor was a hacked piece of shit. Uh, it was a hacked version of a Doom Edit or Doom Edit 2. It actually would not let us build rooms uh, with angles other than 90 degrees at first for like two months. And this is what I was building our first zones in. We had forests in the game that were like the walls of trees or 90 degree angles that I would never have time to go back and actually rip out. The characters were straight out of Poser. Poser was not even to version 1.0 at this time. It was a beta version of Poser. And we pretty much had an artist just, you know, paint directly over those characters, pretty much almost in their default pose. Uh, you can see the characters down there. These were the uh, characters that we shipped with. That art would change uh, more than once. This is my first design document. It is a map of the world. And pretty much other than the three towns on the right of the map, Silver Lamp, Berg, and Hakka, pretty much everything else in here was actually in the shipped version of the game. Uh, this is the uh, actual world map that we ended up shipping um, about a year later. You can compare and contrast if you really care, but I'll let you do that when I post the slides up uh, later. Uh, 
Steve and his friend John Hankey, who he's going to business school with, uh, were chasing money, and that was a re really, really tough. And they were basically had this cool technology, and they're just trying to get some anybody to actually show some interest in it. Uh, we would have frequent demos where the entire company, which at the time was like six people, would, when we called a demo, every one of us would log on in order to make the game feel populated. Uh, just so that you could actually see it, people waving around, because a 3D engine, an MMO without p other people in it, is, well, it wasn't a very good looking game. Um, I was the new guy, and so I got to demonstrate the female art. Um, as a result of that, my dev character uh, remained a female dev character for the entire life of my uh, tenure on Meridian 59, just on a happenstance. Hey, here's character creation. We didn't waste a lot of time and effort on GUI artists, as you can tell. The art for the faces was an order of magnitude higher resolution than the bodies uh, because we felt it was really important that the faces could be expressive. Uh, you actually can't really tell very obviously, but the, the legs in particular are very pixelated looking down. We also didn't have, we also cut out for, for art time and space the angles of 45 degrees from the two back angles. So, you know, they, it just snapped to those angles. The building these characters was insane from an art perspective because you are talking about pasting eyes and noses and hair on top of each other, and this is all sprite-based. Uh, the arms were broken off. They were sprite-based. They had to be pasted onto hot spots. Uh, the, the legs, uh, were, uh, it, it was all sprite-based, and they all had to be uh, shot from these different angles and then pasted together to look complete. Uh, assembling that art was a nightmare because we didn't believe in good tools. Uh, we did have facial expressions, though. That was actually one of the first features that we got in. You could smile, you could frown. On December 15th, 1995, we put the game up for download and posted it up in a couple of news groups. At the time, the game had one quest, no sense of character progression at all, no spells, no guilds, one ability, you could swing your sword, three monsters, I think they were all giant insects for some reason, and very, very crude combat. Uh, and we logged on, and there were five people online in, in the next morning, and it was awesome. Just to see other people inside of this space, and we didn't know who they were. That was great. Um, we started to see buzz in magazines. Notice that in the early days of online gaming, it wasn't a very high bar to meet. Just the fact that we were online meant that we could have just spells and advancement. That's, yay. Um, the other thing that's fascinating about going back and reading uh, previews from this time is that they ha this guy has to spend two paragraphs explaining what an internet game is, and you have to pay a subscription to connect to it, and you'd probably also have to pay money to connect to the internet to connect to it. I mean, uh, there was a lot of inches that just had to go to explaining how an online game worked. In... In... Uh, March, we actually put up our beta rule. Uh, there we got up to 35 people quickly because we actually advertised it a little more aggressively. And pretty much what happened is that we discovered that people like to kill each other an awful lot. The spawn point for the game was a sea of bodies as far as the eye could see. And so one of my first things that I did was to write code for as fast as I could any PK rules that I could think of. Those PK rules, the red flag, uh, orange flag system, ended up being identical to pretty much the rules that the other games after us would end up taking, which I assume they actually put more design thought in it than we did. Um, anyway, we snuck those rules in. Uh, the player killers complained that they now couldn't kill people freely. Uh, that being said, the game was full all the time at 35 people. We had to jettison people off of the game so we could log on in order to actually debug it. And we would do it randomly, too, just psh, kick you right off. Uh, we hired a couple world builders, one of which is my brother in this very humiliating prom photo that I found of him. Uh, the other one is Rob. We didn't really hire him. He volunteered to work for free, which was good because we didn't have much money. And they came in and immediately proved that the engine could do much greater things than I was capable of doing with it. Uh, 
one of the things that I learned previously, I had worked on text muds. And the nice thing about text muds is that as long as you can type it, it can become a reality. So it's very easy to have 500 monsters. When you have to actually draw the art, and again, draw sprite-based art and from multiple angles, every conceivable angle, that's a lot tougher. Content was way more expensive, and we just really didn't have this idea that we should actually invest in that. Uh, we were just trying to get enough of a game going. And so we had 30 monsters, I believe, when we shipped. Seven, that counted seven weapons. I think on, on the game that I work on now, Star Wars, I think you can get seven different weapons on the starting zone. Um, we had a small handful of particle effects that we were used frequently, and maybe around 30 rooms or zones. You had to load between the zones, of course. Um, most of the art was done remotely. Most of the art was done uh, cheaply uh, from any source of cheap art that we could possibly find. Uh, there was no sense of design iteration. We didn't even have the expertise to understand that you might need a firm art direction or any kind of design interaction. We were just like, give us an ant. Well, that's the ant we got. I guess we're using that ant. It was just, it was just, we didn't know how to make a game. Uh, because they were remote, it was not implausible for an artist to just disappear. Just like we'd give them a whole wad of art. We need like five more giant insects because it Mike liked giant insects. I don't know why. Uh, but, and we wouldn't get him because he decided he needed to take a break and wouldn't tell us. And he's like, well, then don't pay me. And we're trying to like make demos and, and get it up at, uh, and show people and get money. Uh, one of the good ones was Chris Sellers, uh, who was the third Sellers brother. I know a lot of people complain that nowadays people say, what would WoW do? Uh, we were saying, what would UO do from the very early days? Uh, we were looking very closely at what we, uh, they were doing because we figured they knew how to design games and we sure didn't. Uh, one of the things that they did was they were going with the use space advancement system. Uh, we said clearly that's the future of RPGs and so we copied that wholesale. It's probably the worst design decision I made in my entire tenure on the game. It was just wrong for the game. Uh, my brother wants me to say up here publicly that I was wrong and he was right. And I, the reason why is because pretty much I was the gameplay coder. Uh, Chris and Andrew were coding the client and the server respectively, and I, I had picked up coding all of the game rules. Uh, what this meant is that every single skill and ability pretty much had to have its own advancement path, its own pacing mechanism set in, uh, its own exploit proofing in order to prevent it from happening. A good example is the way that you would gain hit points is take damage. Well, people would park in front of monsters and that you know, where they could heal faster than take the damage from and then wake up the next morning with a, a full set of hit points. It was silly. One of the things that we couldn't figure out how to give on a use-based basis was mana, which was the mana pool that allows you to cast spells inside the game. So instead what I did was I created these little things that you touched in the world that boosted your mana pool by somewhere between five to ten mana points. Um, this proved to be insanely popular, and this proved to be one of the best design decisions that I made inside of the game, um, because it created exploration puzzles inside the space. Uh, we were able to hide these all over the world, and then people were incentivized to go and look for them. And we were able to do really tricky things, such as have doors that opened on timers so that this was only available at midnight on Tuesdays, have puzzles that required two people to unlock them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but most of the time, they were hidden behind uh, jumping puzzles, geometry puzzles of climbing thin walls. And I say jumping puzzles, I don't mean jumping puzzles. We didn't have jump. So it was really falling puzzles. Can I actually fall and land on the other side and hit that? Um, this proved to be impressively social for us. The uh, players, the guilds, a huge part of guild initiations in our game was actually the guilds taking all, the, uh, all of their new players on a world tour of the entire game to touch all of these mana nodes so that they could get their full mana pool because at the core, Meridian 59 was a PvP game. So it was very important that your entire guild had their full mana pool as soon as possible. Uh, mana uh, nodes were clearly, uh, definitely, the inspiration for Datacrons in Star Wars The Old Republic, which is a key uh, uh, exploration mechanic in the game that I'm working on now. And I see the soul of it inside of the Vistas in Guild Wars 2 as well. We had a crazy idea that you had to fight your way out of the underworld when you died. And so we would teleport you to this zone, which was the best underworld that I could come up with, 
uh, with the limited tools that we had. And we would spawn monsters, and you had to fight your way past the monsters. And it turns out that after you face a humiliating defeat in the world, you really don't want to face another humiliating defeat in hell. Uh, and so we ended up removing all the monsters and just making it so you had to climb up these stairs to go to a portal. And then they said, oh, we don't even like climbing those stairs, and so we put a portal on the floor. And we turned the rest of the underworld into a really cool mana node puzzle where you needed to get four friends to suicide with you so that you could hit switches at the right time to make a mana node appear on that center pillar that you see uh, on the right side of that screenshot. Uh, around this time, I should note that I was uh, seriously losing my shit. Um, Pretty much I was writing the design documents, I was coding most of the game systems, I was the primary gameplay programmer on the game, and we didn't have any QA, we didn't have any customer service, so for our little group of 35 players that were logging in, I was pretty much handling that. We didn't really have message boards outside the game, but we had them inside the game. Uh, I was trying to keep track of those. Uh, and I was losing my mind. I actually had nightmares about me failing because it was my first design job. I was like four months in and had all this responsibility. I had nightmares about imagining my teammates on the street with tin cups begging for change because I had failed, right? Which was funny because I had never met them before and we were working remotely and so my brain just made up appearances for all of them and in my dream state just said, oh, that's Andrew Kremsey and he's begging for change. And that's very weird. Anyway, we got the attention of 3DO. Uh, 3DO was trying to get out of the hardware business, and they started to believe in online in a big way. Um, I have to give props to Trip Hopkins, who I personally, personally believe is probably the, one of the first serious movers and shakers inside the game industry to say that online was the future. Uh, he had a hard time convincing the, his board of that, but he had a very easy time convincing the press of that. Uh, more to the point, 3DO needed to get out of the console space in a hurry. Uh, the 3DO was kind of a flop, mostly because it was very expensive, but also because no one would make games for it. Uh, it cost $700 at the time. This chart shows how much it cost in inflated dollars, which is about $1,100 in today's dollars, uh, which is, it was a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a console, and EA wouldn't make games for it, and because EA wouldn't make games for it, very few pe other people were willing to make games for it, so there was no there there. And so they were trying to get out of that space and try to find a new niche as fast as they could, so they looked to online. Um, they put together a deal very, very fast where they bought the company for $5 million in 3DO stock with a six-month vest time. Uh, that stock would lose 75% of its value in that time. And then we all moved to San Francisco where we actually met each other for the first time. And that's when I discovered that they didn't look anything like my nightmares. Before they bought us, 3DO promised that they weren't going to just rush us out the door and get us on the shelf, and that they would give us time to add content and replace art, become a AAA game so that we could complete with UO. Uh, UO. Uh, they lied. Um, 3DO was using us basically for a test case of the online market. They had some internal games that they really thought were going to be big games because they were seriously funded, uh, had really long-term plans, and had some really superstar talent that they brought in. Uh, one of those games, uh, I'm not kidding, is uh, involved giant robots playing baseball in space. But they really wanted to get us out as fast as possible. To give you an idea how fast, uh, they bought us in June and we shipped in September. Well, you think about how fast you had to actually, how long it takes to print a CD. Yeah, we had about two months of time, of which some of that time was just moving people to Redwood City. We had very little time before we shipped this game uh, to actually polish it up and get it up to snuff. Uh, we, they did give us an art director. They told us they would give us an art director to replace all the art. They gave us art director. He looked. He said, oh, I have two months. I have enough time to replace the NPCs. This is why the NPCs are the best-looking thing in the game. Uh, these are also all billboards, so a uh, granny there, no matter what angle that you are in the room, is always kind of snubbing you. So, One of uh, our most interesting game mechanics that we got in right before ship was the introduction of guilds and guild halls. So we knew we wanted to add guilds, and we put in chat channels for guilds so people can communicate for all over the world. We realized that we had about 30 guilds per server, and so what we did is we put 10 guild halls on each server. And what's more, 
if you wanted a guild hall, you had to go and take it. And what's more, the guild halls had a very clear pecking order. I mean, this here is the best looking guild hall. I'm sorry, it's kind of a cruddy screenshot uh, in the game. But it was a really majestic looking uh, guild hall that we had. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we had the guild hall that really was a, the back of a warehouse with no other rooms and a, you know, a, a, a hay roof. And I, it, it just felt crappy. So there's this real sense of trading up your guild hall to get a better guild hall. And so the primary action was players trying to take over each other's guild halls inside the space. Um, it's worth noting that you'll realize, you're going to hear me talk a lot about PK mechanics that we put in because, I can't stress this enough, we had no content. We just couldn't afford it. We didn't even fathom asking to build like an EverQuest amount of content. Uh, and so it was all about what can we do to make player interactions interesting. And by that, we meant kill each other. Um, the thing about guild halls is that in order to take it, you had to stealth in, which meant going in, usually either secretly, invisibly, behind somebody who was trying to go into their own guild hall, or you had to get them to betray their guild, uh, which happened a lot and was pretty funny. Um, we, we would have CS calls where they, the, they would say, oh, we just lost our guild, and one guy would send me a whisper, like, no, dude, I betrayed it. It's cool. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, it drove a ton of politics and player dynamics, uh, even though the guild halls were largely useless. The, the net effect of a guild hall was you had a cool place to have marriages and you had a message board. Um, the, other th the biggest problem that we had was that there was no reason to go to your guild halls and we had to, a real problem with guilds basically taking over the guild hall and then just protecting their guild by never going inside of it, which is not really cool. We had global chat. We also had global chat spam. But you could talk to the entire server. Uh, in fact, even death messages went to the whole server, which is really great in a PK game because you know in some ways going on a pilling, uh, killing spree. Uh, but in terms of the chat spam, we found a novel solution, which again was a last minute hack to solve an emergency problem, and that is that we made it so that it cost energy, which is the, the energy that warriors use to swing their sword or, or do their warrior abilities. This had the net effect of uh, making it so that you could only send one global chat message every 30 seconds or so. Uh, and it also made it, because it was a PvP game, making sure that you were pretty safe before you sent a, a chat message out to the entire world. Uh, it also uh, accidentally penalized warriors more than wizards. This is what happens when you try to slam in a solution uh, as fast as you possibly can. Anyway, we shipped. Before we shipped, we had 25,000 people playing the beta. I forgot to get the number of how many people we peaked at after we shipped, but uh, we did okay. That was the box on the, that we put on the shelves right there. Uh, we shipped on September 27th, 1996. Coincidentally, 3DO Fiscal was four days after that. Uh, we did indeed ship the disk to printing uh, while we were still massively fixing bugs on the server. Um, our first virtual prostitute appeared eight hours after the game went live. Estimated budget of three hundred thousand uh, dollars to get to this point, which was pretty funny to me now. The game engine wasn't very advanced, but the server was really rock solid, and the client almost never crashed. In our first six months, we had one server crash. That server crash happened when a customer service representative tried to put a troll in someone's backpack. Uh, stability and memory usage was so good that somebody had the broad idea to uh, stop having planned weekly downtimes, and that's when we discovered that the game could run for 22 hours before timers would stop working, uh, 22 days before timers would stop working, and do you know what breaks in an MMO if you don't have timers? Absolutely everything. These are some of the features that we had in ship that might surprise you. We had in-game message boards. Uh, we had in-game mail. Uh, we had good patching. Our guild system uh, is actually fairly similar to the guild system that World of Warcraft shipped with. Uh, and you know, we had a who list. Here's a list of the features that we uh, didn't have at all. Like, not even a glimmer in our eye. Uh, here's some more. <laughs> we didn't have mouse look in a game that shipped around the time Quake did. And it's still hard to play because the mouse look we ended up putting in was years later and is kind of awful. 
we didn't have quests. We had very, very rudimentary quests, nothing like a quest log. Uh, the quests that we did have, uh, most of them were randomly generated, like, hey, go and say these three words to this NPC across the town. It, it was, it was, we leaned on PVP as our content. That's, that's what we had. Uh, this is just a strategy guide I found uh, as part of a uh, marketing handout that 3DO was handing out at shows. Still we won RPG of the Year 1996 from Game Center, which I hold as a small tiny piece of pride because the other two big contenders for that year were Daggerfall and Diablo. That, you know, see how that turned out. This is our first ad. You might notice it's the worst uh, ad for video game you've ever seen. Engage in thousands of exciting relationships with total strangers without wearing anything made of latex. I'm an advertising major, and this was painful to me because we had a game with such a unique selling proposition compared to everything else out there that this should have been the easiest game in the world to sell. And yeah, here's, here's, here's our second ad. Next time someone tells you to get a life, tell them you've already got one. Meridian 59 online. Our third ad, which came with an expansion pack, just had a scantily clad woman on it, and we were so happy. <laughs> uh, we had a dupe bug uh, fairly early in our life cycle where pretty much people were able to make gold at will. Uh, overnight, the entire economy of the game for players trading with each other became Dark Angel Feathers. Uh, the reason why is that Dark Angel Feathers were what you used to cast the most powerful player-killing spells in the game, uh, Hold and Blind in particular. And so uh, player killers really wanted them, and player killer, uh, people who didn't like player killing really wanted the player killers to not have them. So, uh, yeah, just the fact that we had this entirely new economy show up overnight I always found very fascinating. Uh, before we shut down servers, we had to start a save, and that took a while. And I forget the specifics of this, but basically we had to tell the players, hey, everything you do after this point, between now and the time the server shuts down, is not going to be saved. So do whatever. It turns out that do whatever means kill each other. And it was wildly popular. So popular that we ended up supporting it with a, what you see as a blood red sky effect. Anytime you saw that sky go bright red, you would just turn around and start killing whoever was closest to you. It was awesome. And it was also a very, very uh, effective cue to you. If you don't like player killing, it's time to log off now. Oh, we had a hack program, uh, Meridian Extreme. Uh, it was very similar to UO Assist, uh, which was they would ha basically hack the data stream in between the client uh, and the game, uh, where they would basically figure out anything that we hadn't protected properly uh, in order to uh, basically do whatever they wanted to. So, for example, uh, you could buy from a vendor any place in the world, which was very handy. Um, the honest players got really pissed off because we weren't taking action against this fast enough, especially, I think, uh, walking through walls and uh, speed hacking. And so they uh, helpfully created a new update of Meridian Extreme and put it up for everybody to download on their own site, and that version would log you in and delete your character. <laughs> Those were really fun customer service calls to take. This also introduced an entirely new vector of marketing issues and customer service issues and PR issues that, that 3DO just had no idea how to respond to. Uh, we fired a really popular uh, customer service representative because he was handing out items. He was abusing his power in game. And it actually made whatever the version of Market Watch was back then, and our stock dropped by a point for a day. And, 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 and no, no, don't know if that's actually related, but our executives were freaking the hell out. Um, we banned a guild for duping, and they went and told PCGamer.com, uh, who made it a front page story that we were actually denying paying customers service to, uh, that they had rightfully paid for. You have to understand, this was not, this was a very alien anti-consumer idea back then. This is before Gordon came along and made it okay. Um, it, it was a very, very weird idea and it pissed off a lot of people. Um, 
we actually had German partners who put up a German shard. Uh, they put up a no PvP shard, which was funny because every game system in the game is actually a PvP system. Um, we had a guide program. It went awry from time to time. We had a player, uh, a guide who went rogue. He used the one guide power that we have to teleport everybody in the game, one by one, marching down the list to this room. This is the Ghost of Farnal, which is a boss monster. They would have enough time to say, what the fuck, and then they would die. And uh, somebody tells me, I log in, I kick the player, and immediately the two guys that were still around started looting the corpses of all of the players around them. And of course we had nothing like backups of players or any way to actually track some metrics, what? No, we, we, we had nothing we could really do about this. Yes, in Meridian 59 when you died, even by player killing you lost all your stuff. Our first uh, expansion pack came about uh, four to six months after we shipped the game. It was called v uh, Veil of Sorrows. Uh, it had a profanity filter, a latency indicator, in-game chess, which was really a chess board where you could put pieces around, but it didn't actually enforce any rules. <laughs> and no AI. That would be silly. Um, it also had the Veil of Sorrows, which was another mana node. Uh, this was uh, basically, it was kind of a factional mana node, good guys for bad guys, and two groups of fairies, and the, the general idea is that in this case, if you took the mana node and you were the bad guys, you would take it away from all the good guy players. And so uh, there was this idea of control over a mana node. Again, PvP experimentation was something that we did a lot of. Um, and Rich Vogel would kill me if I didn't mention that this was the era that he was on the project. Uh, we had a faction system. Uh, basically, this was insp uh, inspired by smear the queer. Uh, the general idea is every now and then you kill something and a token would drop. And one of these guys, either the princess or the duke, uh, wanted that token. And you could then carry that token to one of the consulars uh, scattered throughout the world, who would teleport to random places, by the way, for extra annoyance points. And if you gave it to them, then you're standing with the princess and the duke would go up and their standing would go up as well. Uh, in the meantime, you couldn't carry anything, you moved at slower speed, you couldn't fight, and so you needed other people to basically shuttle you while carrying this token through the world. Um, you'll notice that this is another axis of people to, to kill each other that's completely separate than the day-night axis and it's completely separate from the guild access. Like, we, we, we had people set against their, uh, their allies multiple ways and multiple dimensions, uh, which is interesting in retrospect and not at all planned. It's just because, you know, we didn't put any forethought into any of this. Uh, it's worth noting, although I don't know the specifics of it, that in the post Damien uh, era of Meridian 59, the faction system actually ended up becoming the central focus of the game. We added a third faction, made all of that more robust. Uh, I wish I could tell you more about that, but I really don't, I didn't understand it when I read about it. Um, the game also helpfully told you, told everybody that you had found a token and were carrying it. Good luck. We had a player arena. Uh, the player arena allowed you to sign up for both one-on-one -on -one matches as well as team matches. Uh, the floor configuration was chosen randomly at startup. So you see those lines on the floor, those are walls that would come up so that every time, every fight would have basically a different maze configuration that you had to deal with. Um, and so that was pretty cool. Uh, you could watch from the stands but not actually affect the fight on the floor. Uh, and it's worth noting here that this was an enormous pain in the ass to code uh, to, uh, to do that last part. Uh, be sure that you, couldn't act, you could cast beneficial spells on people outside but not on people on the floor. And it was basically this extra baggage on every new ability that we had to add to the degree that later when I was interviewing at Origin and they asked me, how would you implement an arena system in Ultima Online, I said I wouldn't run far, far away. This is funny. Uh, we had 10 servers. They were called 101, 102, 103. 101. Uh, the entire population of server 109 just got bored one day, and they decided to invade server 108. 
They all chose the name clone, clone one, clone two, clone three, clone four, so on, so forth. And they would be happy and friendly, and every now and then a player would kill you, but they would only communicate in binary. <laughs> so you had to actually decode what they were saying, and most people didn't have the patience for it. And so Server 108 freaked the hell out. They were freaking, they were calling customer service to say, what do we do about this? And we're like, well, kill them? We don't know, it's a PvP game. I, um, they had like a clone mistress or something and she spoke for all of them. It was, it was very weird. Um, and th this was another example where the community rose up to defend itself. Uh, one of the players on 108 finally got the bright idea, hey, I'll create a clone character and he just created characters until he got an empty clone number and once he logged in, they just included him there in their group and he got to basically get all of the dirt of what was going on inside of the clone army, and, and, including some incredibly personal dirt involving girlfriends and cheating and whatnot. And he, he just posted it all on a message board, and that pretty much diffused the entire problem right there. Our, our second expansion was Revelations. Uh, around this time, they decided that giant robots in space, uh, baseball was not going to fly, and they gave us uh, a lot of those resources so that we could compete with Ultima Online. So this was pretty much the biggest, most significant update, and particularly in terms of content that we ever had. Uh, we had uh, we added a tutorial system. It may well be the worst tutorial system ever done. Uh, pretty much, we were trusting that you could figure out to click these signs, which would tell you what to do. The uh, uh, we also got maps. I probably should have a slide on that. Uh, you could annotate those maps. That was a feature that we had. Uh, we could now do slopes. This was a big deal. See, and we used that in order to make this sort of vaguely uh, uh, Aztec Mayan uh, theme for our new race, as well as the roofs that you see inside of the other zone. Uh, our Rob, who was our Lord, Lord, lead world builder at the time, was so happy. You could do slopes, it was awesome. Um, this allowed us to make the most ambitious stuff in the game yet, and this expansion was, in fact, what we released pretty much right on top of Ultima Online. Uh, it's worth mentioning my stupidest, our stupidest mistake. We didn't want it to just be you get on a boat or use a teleporter to go over there. We thought it'd be really cool if there was a puzzle that you had to do in order to get to New Aztec Island uh, full of bird creatures. And so we made it so that you had to go through a tunnel inside of a dungeon that already existed. And you had to solve a very simple puzzle, which was cast Dispel Illusion. Now, Dispel Illusion was a new spell. Spells required reagents. All of those reagents were on the island. <laughs> So, for about three days, we're feeling pretty proud of ourselves because no one had solved our really awesome puzzle. And then around day four, day five, we're like, really, they should have figured it out by now. And we figured out what was going on, and we had to do a hot fix where we hot fixed in uh, loot packages on some monsters. And then we actually had to have an event where we spawned in these monsters in a, a, a town raid just so that they could drop these reagents. And our players thought that was the coolest thing they'd ever see, that we had this event that unlocked the new zone. That's awesome. Uh, more experimentation from high school games. Uh, we added chaos as an organized sport. Who's familiar with this? Really? So if you signed up, we gave you a dagger. That dagger would have someone else's name on it. You had to hit him three times with that dagger. Someone else had a dagger with your name on it. You didn't know who. If you hit somebody who wasn't one of those two people with your dagger, you were out of the game. So whoever was last man standing basically won the game. And yeah, so this is something that we used to play in high school, and so I said, okay, that sounds awesome, let's put it in the game, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, the biggest issue was dealing with people who took a dagger and just never logged back on. We had player politics. Uh, I mentioned before we had this very simple flagging system, which I wanna stress, we put in our first draft flagging system and pretty much rode that. Um, if you kind of hit somebody but didn't kill them, your name would go orange. You were an outlaw. If you killed somebody, your name would go red. It was very possible for this to happen accidentally, especially if you're using AOE spells. Uh, so people would get flagged orange or red all the time, and we just knew that we were never going to be able to solve this problem ourselves. And so what we did was we made it so that the entire server could elect a Justicar. The Justicar would have the ability to grant 10 pardons per week before a new Justicar was elected. 
and he could basically take you from red to orange and orange to white. And most of the time this worked really well, and then the electorate would get very complacent, and they would not bother to vote, and then the player killers would stuff the ballot box with all of their alts. They would elect somebody who was very player killer friendly. He'd pardon all the player killers, and then everybody would freak the hell out. And it didn't matter because all the player killers would be, have red names again before the week was over. Um, but yeah, this was actually very cool. We found that it was vital to run events. It was possible for us to run events because we only had 10 servers. And we found that our most successful events were when we showed them anything that they had not seen before, no matter how terrible it looked. This is a red Yeti, and if it looks like it is a Yeti drenched in blood, yes, that's what it is. Uh, I tried to find the picture of the uh, ice monster, which is perhaps the single ugliest thing that's ever been created in the history of computer games. Um, and, you know, we didn't put it in the core game because it was just that terrible looking, but finally we put it into, uh, into one of these events, and players freaked out because they'd just never seen it before. And, and yeah, so that's just when we learned that even the smallest differences in the world could have big impact. Our second expansion included changing all of the player art. The big benefit of this is this allowed us to uh, have things like hued pants and hued robes. Our fans did not fixate on that. What they fixated on the fact was all the female characters now had big asses. This is when I learned not to mess with players' art. Uh, this is also around the time that uh, 3DO killed the game. Uh, 3DO decided to go on a price change where basically the management decided that they were personally offended that people who played the game a lot were paying the same 9.95 fee as people who logged in once a week. Uh, and so they wanted a billing a model that actually ref reflected that. And so what they did is they said, hey, It'll be two forty nine per day, but never more than ten bucks per week, and never more than thirty bucks per month, which meant that our new pricing was thirty bucks a month. So this happened at the same time that UO launched, uh, which was just, as you might imagine, terrible, just terrible for us, because it just even the people who didn't want to play UO said, "What the hell are you trying to do to us here?" Um, some, unfortunately, it proved to be the correct decision from a, a, a dollars and cents point of view because we only lost half of our customers who are now paying three times as much. But really, what it really did was just hollow out the, the, the player base. Our server populations just dropped. And in, in a PvP game, uh, your players are the content. And so the, the game just fell off a cliff after that. Our third expansion was Renaissance. I was not on the team at this time. The team after me uh, introduced the Hunters and Necromancers scenario, which is uh, amazing because it's perhaps the single most impressive uh, PK act in history. Basically, the scenario was Necromancers would get buffs every time they killed somebody. Hunters would get an awesome weapon that was really good for killing necromancers. And the idea was the two were supposed to hate each other and kill each other. And there was a safety valve, which is if the Lich Queen died, uh, then the game was reset. The necromancers would die, lose their buff. The hunters would lose their weapons. Um, that's how it was supposed to work. Uh, but the ne what happened was the necromancers and the hunters just colluded. They got together and said, hey, you've got cool buffs. We've got awesome weapons. Let's just work together and kill everybody else. And so you, we, this actually became kind of a status quo on every single server. Um, and they would just forget that there was this safety valve that happened. And I wish I could have found you the awesome screenshot of just the spam of the one guy that killed the Lich Queen by himself. And I told you, global chat messages on death. Bob has died, Fred has died, Steve has died, Dan has died. Everybody died on the whole server all in one shot. So, yeah, that was, that was, I miss this game. Um, this is when uh, Brian Green took over, and I mention that because he was very significant in the post-3DO reality for Meridian 59. Um, UO didn't hurt us as bad as we thought. It was just a, uh, we thought it would. The price change hurt us more. The price, the timing wasn't exactly on top of each other. Uh, EverQuest really, you know, crushed uh, Meridian, just the 3D aspect of it. It was really close to what we were trying to do. Uh, and yeah, that was when things pretty much went to hell. Um, 
3DO shutdown Meridian uh, 59 on August 31st, 2000. Um, at which point, Rob and Brian uh, bought the game for cheap in 2002. They tried to buy it immediately, but they were actually screwed by zealous fans who basically, when Rob and Brian were bidding on it, were also trying to bid on it at the same time for a ludicrous price, like six figures price, uh, to which 3DO said, oh, let's see you come up with six figures. And yeah, so basically Rob and Brian had to wait for, the, for 3DO to realize that that money was never going to materialize before they could buy it for a realistic price. Um, Shortly after they launched the game, they hinted that they had 2,000 subscribers that were paying a fairly low price point. Uh, it's worth noting, just as a footnote, that 3DO itself would go out of business um, in 2003, not long after shutting down the game. Uh, 2004, Meridian 15, we're now well into the history where I was involved, so I'm going to gloss over it, and I apologize for that. Uh, but in 2004, the Meridian 59 Evolution update offered a new graphics engine where we added... Mouse look, <laughs> rebindable keys, dynamic lighting. It was really like looking at a different game. And that was actually the movie that you saw was a fan movie that they had a contest for where they were celebrating that launch. Um, 2008, we got our nude patch. You remember when I told you that the, uh, the faces were an order of magnitude higher resolution than the bodies? Here you see that in action. <laughs> um, in 2010, NDS closed their doors. Uh, Near Death Studios always saw Meridian 59 as being able to get enough revenue for them to fund other things. It just never got the population for that to happen. They were able to basically keep uh, Meridian going. It was self-sustaining, but it wasn't able to actually spring load other stuff. And so they closed their doors. The original brothers who started it all uh, reacquired the rights from uh, Rob and Brian, and they put the game up. It's up to the, and on this day as a free play experience. And less than a month ago, the code was put up as open source. You can look at it this day and see what terrible, terrible scripting I did when I started my career. And uh, even today, two Meridian uh, servers exist. I logged into one two nights ago. They were complaining about player killers. I could not figure out how to swing my weapon. I really could not figure out how to mouse look. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that is uh, the history of Marooning 59. I feel like the, the lessons of how to make MMOs uh, from Marooning 59 have pretty much been absorbed and demonstrated by games like EverQuest and Dark Age of Camelot and uh, uh, World of Warcraft. But, you know, so I thought it would be more useful to close this out with some of the personal lessons that I learned and some of the growth that I encountered that made me sort of the designer I uh, am today. Uh, the first is, you have limitations as a designer, suck it down. Uh, we had no content. We had no way of getting content. We were in no way going to get content. That forced us to be a game that was all about player versus player activity. We had no other way to go. And so what we did is just, hey, how can we innovate on that? How can we do that better? Uh, and that really just being inside of that box really made me grow as a designer. And it also made me think about problems in terms of the play space uh, that I don't play a lot of. I am a lousy player killer, actually. Um, but I, it turns out I'm a pretty decent player killing designer. Um, the second thing that I learned is that virtual worlds are more than just fun. And this is just very personal to me. It, this is when I realized that virtual worlds were my calling. And the reason why is it's not, you, you hear a lot about divorces caused by games like Ultima Online, EverQuest, and WoW. Uh, you hear less about the, 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 the weddings, uh, the people who find true love. Uh, and even more poignantly, uh, I have in a letter from a kid who had cancer and... To him, Meridian 59 was his ability to pretend that he could walk, uh, to be able to flirt with girls and, and for them to not know, to not treat him with pity, uh, for him to feel like a hero. Uh, and that was so absolutely reaffirming to me in terms of a, a career choice uh, that this is what I wanted to do because, uh, well, for starters, I could explain what I did to my mother now with some level of pride. Um, one of the things that really benefited me as a designer was because we weren't the runaway success that 3DO hoped for, they kind of just left us alone and say, hey, just don't lose too much money. Just, just as long as you're pretty much profitable, do whatever the heck you want. 
And in terms of being a designer, that's incredibly fertile design space. We, were, we did all sorts of wacky stuff. Just, you know, let's try it out. And we would try something that didn't work. We'd either rip it out or try, some, or try to twist it a little. And that was, you know, just a great way for me to grow as a designer was just to, you know, not work on the, the, the biggest, most ambas, uh, ambitious things, but to actually have that little playpen where I could just fool around. Uh, and last but not least, uh, you know, if you're working on labor of love, you really have to love what you do. Uh, anyway, that is the history of Marine 59. Uh, I am more than happy to take any questions that you might have about any of this. Anybody? Just a single question. Sure. I think the, uh, the, 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 a short version of the question is, what's the difference between working on uh, a game with this level of control and a game that as big as, as uh, Star Wars uh, uh, is now? And the answer is really, the biggest thing is the, it's less about the approval and more about the time and speed of iteration. So a, you know, a Star Wars patch unless it's an emergency hotfix, has a long time to cook. It has to, uh, you know, it's not so much the approval. Usually, uh, in, in our case, Lucas lets us do uh, most of what we want to do, but it has to go through QA process, go through a lengthy QA process. Now, we didn't believe in that QA processes of individual hotfixes on Meridian 59. Um, they didn't know how to QA Meridian 59 because they were still living in a console world where the way that you QA a product was you got a new build on a disc, you put it in, and you just played the game, which took 20 hours, 30 hours. You were done in a week. You replayed the whole game. Um, you know, it, it was an MMO. It, you know, 20 to 30 hours would, you know, wouldn't get you very far inside of Meridian 59. And, and, you know, it took them a long time to realize, no, we have to test the pieces parts of it. Testing hotfixes didn't happen a lot, and you know, if we felt like doing something, we would generally stick them in. Uh, we didn't have that kind of uh, process, uh, which meant that the possibility of screwing up was very high. Of course, the other side of it is that we had a team that was very small and knew the game very well, and everybody knew what everyone else was doing all the time. Um, Star Wars, the old Republic, you know, had hundreds of people working on it, and it was impossible for you to know what everyone else was doing and whether or not, you know, uh, the beams crossed. And so, yeah, the, the processes have to exist, but that sort of nimbleness is really uh, the biggest difference. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I think that it uh, hit a certain point really fast. I don't remember what that point was, but it was in the low five figures. I don't think it hit its beta numbers, uh, but I'm not sure of that. And I think it pretty much stayed there uh, until around the time the price change happened and then UO happened. Uh, you have to remember, there weren't a whole lot else going on at the time. And the games that were out there were very different. Uh, you know, Realm was not like Meridian. The Realm was not like Meridian 59. Kingdom of Drakkar wasn't either. Uh, it would be a year before Underlight would come out. Uh, you know, it was just the, the, the competitive landscape was there was no competition uh, at the time. The, the portal games were desperately trying to become unportaled, but even then, none of them were really 3D. So it was, it was just a you know, very, very different uh, market altogether. One more question. Yes. Uh, the question was, what, did we want to make a PvE game or, or did we want to make a PvP game? And the answer was, we wanted to make an online game. Like, we, we, there, there really was no mission statement because at the time you didn't need that kind of focus. I mean, we knew that if we got an online game up and running in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, uh, especially given that we were a team of 
well, you know, eight to 20 people based on what time of that time frame you looked on. That was a monumental achievement by itself. And also, again, there were no formal game designers on that team. Like I, it was my first design project. It was Mike Seller's first design project. Um, you know, we all had, you know, experience doing paper games and whatnot, but none of this whole, hey, a game needs a consistent art direction and a game needs to be about something. The entire design of the game was pretty much entirely organic. And then that's just because, well, uh, you know, that's the world we were living in and we didn't know what the hell we were doing. So anyway, it's past time. I want to thank you all for staying for the last talk of the day. Um, and uh, I will mention that to this day, if you go to meridian59.com, you can play the game and you can download the source code. So thank you very much. <laughs>